have their uh, primary source on their desk, please. Now, one of the big things that we'll be dealing with this year that is definitely different from previous years is that uh, we, on your exam on May 12th, by the way, you have a lot more visual primary sources than any other year or any other content, except for AP Art History. Obviously, I mean, that makes sense. So, uh, throughout this year, you're going to see a ton of pictures because you need to be able to do them, A, in your multiple choice, and B, in your document, in your DBQ. It also could be a prompt for your short answer questions. So it is completely embedded. They're estimating about 40% of your questions are going on your, out of your 70 are going to be based on a chart, a primary source, or an image. That's a lot of information just coming from that. Does not include your essays. So you have to be comfortable looking at an image and pulling out the content or the information you need to do because it will be all over your exam. Now, fortunate for me, I have been working with images for a while, which, as you will recall from last week's test, there was a lot of images. Would you agree? Okay, so the good thing is I've been kind of training my kids to do a lot of images, but I'm revamping a lot of stuff this year because it's a new exam. One of the things I'm really revamping is my primary sources with images. So when we do images, it's not that Miss Bennett got lazy and didn't want to find a written primary source, it is important that you can look at an image and decipher what time period it comes from, okay, and what are the influences behind it. So please keep that in mind. All right. Who wants to read for me? All right. Cool. Let's go, man. Thank you. It is often said that the ancient Romans used the human as the measure of all things, although flats are probably the Their gods were Especially morality and politics concern the most great thing in humanity. Humanity, particularly from human form, was also the consuming interest of 5th century BC. Romanistic sculptures and graphic artists as the following great pieces of art history. The first example is a black or white painting found on the interior of a Roman The work crafted around 490, 490 BC by artists known simply as the Brightest Painter depicts a... I, I would just sure, that. I have no idea. Yeah. Um, note the animal around, the neck, around her neck. The painter, she, um, oh, the panther, she holds in her left hand and the other countenance of... Bach? Bach, sure. Yeah, worship and Europeans describe Perfect. All right. Thank you. Okay. So looking at the first paragraph, what is the most important thing that came out of that first paragraph? What time period is this from? What Greek time period is it from, Beck? Hellenistic. Hellenistic. And what do we know about the Hellenistic time period, Beck? Okay. So it is a blend of Greek and Persian culture. Okay, so it is a blending. So is it pure Greek? No, so it is a blend. Okay, humanity is a big piece. So we're going to see a lot of um, human form. Humanity, human form with flaws. Okay, when we think about that. Okay, so your first piece is actually down here at the bottom, and we're going to look at it. All right, so uh, Cole just graciously read through our piece. What are we seeing in this image? Who can raise your hand and tell me what are we seeing in the image? Guys, what is in the image? Alex? Well, it's a woman who has the, like, panther in her arm. Okay, woman with a panther. Okay, what else did you say around her? The pellet? The pellet. Okay, pellet. So, pellet is here. We got a live panther here. So, what are we expecting her to probably do? Kill the panther. Okay, kill the panther to get what? Skin the pellet. Skin the panther. Okay. So, is this a weak image or a strong image? Strong. Strong woman. 
Okay? Now, from the information we know, um, animal pellet, the panthers are told, and accoutrements of... So, it's a bacoque worship. So, we may not know what that is, but is it a religious image or not? Yeah. Philip, what do you think? I think it's like a precursor to Bacchus. There you go. Yep. So it has religious connotations. Very nice, Philip. It has religious connotations. It's a celebration. It's a celebratory piece. Why do we know that it's a celebratory piece? What was it in, guys? A wine cup. You don't put sad images at the bottom of a wine cup because you would be sad when you drank. You, you, you typically have, it's usually a celebratory thing. So it is celebratory, okay, and it has religious connotations, okay? All right, so the second work is the Bronze Charitor of Delphi, which I've seen in person, by the way, and it's awe-inspiring. It's beautiful. Sorry, I went through this summer, but oh, don't judge, okay? It's pretty exciting. Uh, which dates from around 470 BCE. This life-size 5 foot 11 charioter was originally part of a four-horse chariot ensemble that stood near the temple of Apollo at Delphi. An inscription records uh, that it was dedicated to celebrate a chariot victory at the Pantheon Games, which were held every four years near Delphi in honor of Apollo. Okay, so this is bronze. If it's bronze, is it a value of no value? High value. High value. Okay. Where is it located? Near the where? Near it's where, like, Robert? Um, it's located near Delphi. Where the whole Apollo okay. So it's near the um, it's near the Temple of Apollo. So is it important or not important? Very important. It has some sort. Okay, near Temple of Apollo. So of high value. Okay, high value. Now, this man is just a simple chariot racer. Does that show what about the value of chair of being a chariter? Is it important or not important to Greeks? Important. So, athleticism <coughs> equals important. Okay. All right. It's made out of bronze, so it has a high value. Okay, it's one of many pieces. All right, inscription, dedicated chariot victory. All right, anything else that we can depict from it? No? All right, I'm going back to the next piece. The earlier, di uh, the earlier dates of the first two pieces place them on the cusp of the classical period of Hellenistic art, but the third piece is unmistakably classical, known as the Girl with Doves. It is a grave monument from the island of Paros. Its style places it squarely in mid-century 450 BCE, carved from Parthian marble. Uh, this raised relief depicts a young girl who died unmarried. The doves symbolize virginity. The artist has created an especially poignant work of art by con contrasting the subject's head with her body. The body is that of a child, note the arms and uh, hands, but her stylish coiffured head is that of a young woman that she'll never become. Note how the sculptor has used the maiden's draped robe into form to her figure. All right, so you're going to have to tilt it. This is the way it actually lies. Okay, so what do we know? What do we know about the piece? What do we got, McKay? Um, it was from Korean mar marble, which is probably very valuable. Very valuable marble. Okay, what else do we know about the piece? What else? Regan? Um, her family was probably very wealthy. Very wealthy family. Okay, what else? What do you got, Charlie? I mean, we know how young she was, because um, there's the dove, which symbolizes her identity. Okay, so a young woman. Young girl, I guess. Young girl died young. Okay, when a young lady died young, we have this beautiful piece. What does that tell us? Calder, what does that tell us? Uh, uh, life is valued. <laughs> okay, life is valued. Okay, what else does it tell us? What do you got? Virginity. Okay, virginity valued. Pureness. Okay, anything else? 
Anything else, Cole? Uh, um, they did. Okay, beauty. Beauty. Okay, they like uh, neo -cla uh, classical age is all about the beauty. All right. So what we're going to do is when you have a collection of pieces from one empire. So we have three pieces. We have the chariot, we have the wine cup, and then of course we have this young lady's grave marker. You have to look at them as one piece. Okay, it's a story, there's one collection. So, when we are looking at our primary sources, we now look at it in form of happy. Historical context, audience, purpose, point of view, and why. Why are all these pieces done? So, the historical context. What can we say about these three pieces in their historical context? Regan. Um, art was probably something very important because they all looked like they took a great deal of time to like carve out each individual piece and every single... I guess, thing in it was thought out exactly the way everything in it has a meaning, I guess. It was an important expression of Greek culture and beliefs. Anything else? What do you got, Andrew? Hellenistic and classical. The last piece is classical. It's pre. Okay, Hellenistic and classical age. Okay, so are the Greeks strong or weak? Greeks are strong and influential. All right, who is the audience for these pieces? Who are the who is the audience? What do you got, Raylan? Who are the Greeks making these pieces for? The wealthier people. Wealthier. Classes in Greece. Why do you say that? There you go, expensive materials. Regan, what do you got? I was thinking probably also their gods because all of them have like some sort of connotation with one of the Greek gods. Appeasing their gods, I'll take that. All right, what is the purpose of the pieces? What is the purpose of the pieces? What do you got, Cole? Um, well, the one we just went over was uh, to honor this uh, dead young man. Okay, all right, absolutely. What about the second piece? Who's the second piece in honor of, or who is it for, Charlie? Um, I guess it was like to honor the charioteers to show how esteemed they were in the society, maybe. Okay, all right, but keep in mind, where was it placed? Uh, so near the Temple of Apollo, so mm -hmm. it could have been a thing, something to worship Apollo. Okay, I would give honor to Apollo. And what's this first image? Philip. So who, pull them all together for me, Philip. What are all of these for? What is the purpose of it? Demonstrate the importance, the influence, the influence of Greek, of the Greeks' gods. On the lives of Greek citizens. And acknowledging... human life. Why do we say that? Do you think a chariot really deserves a place next to the gods? No. Okay. Is Apollo more important than this guy will ever be? Yes, but we're showing that respective life. Okay. We're showing um, the connection of celebration. Okay. And we're seeing the reflection of life. All right. Why? Why would people go through all this effort? Why are people going through all this effort, Sarah Grace? Because Okay, God's happy. What else do you think, Abby? Why are they going through all this effort? Hmm? Okay, I mean, do you, do you doodle and draw just to show your culture? No. Why do we think? What do you got? What do you think, uh, Grace? Um, oh 
Okay, so they're showing... Everyday Greek life of deep connections to the gods shows us what? Shows us what, Regan? Um, probably their devotion <coughs> to their gods, like Dionysus and Apollo, and their fear of them smiting them. Okay, okay, shows, that, uh, shows us that the gods control and influence over life. Okay, point of view, why they do it when they did it. The Greeks wanted to show respect, honor, and provide tribute to the gods. There you go. All right. It has been said that Hellenistic artists created idealized human forms that conveyed a sense of serene balance without losing reality. Based on these examples, do you agree or disagree? So, do you believe these artists convey a sense of serene balance without uh, losing reality? Yes or no? What do you think? Yes? All right, so justify it. Write it out. Here we go. This is what I grade. This is what I care about here. This is what I go th I'll go through this stuff with you, but this is what I'm checking and grading. Full and complete sentences. Based on the three examples, you agree or disagree? Explain why. I'm looking for a sentence or two. That's all I'm looking for. When you are writing this answer, what should you be referencing? Hello? The picture. The picture. Picture three shows a perfectly the, the effort of, curve, of carving the granite or the marble into the perfections of a soft young lady shows the fact that the Greeks cared about the details. That's the type of answer I'm looking for. When you're actually citing the pieces and saying, well, this shows us. Image three shows the delicate curves of the marble which reflect the innocence of this young lady's life. Okay, you have to cite at least two pieces every time you have a question. Okay, you can look at your bronze charioter and you could say the detail to his hair, his eyes, show the care of reflecting the human aspect and reflecting the gods, for the gods. Give you about another twenty seconds. So every time you have a collection and they ask you a question about it, you have to reference at least two of the pieces. You don't have to reference them all. I'm preparing you for your DBQ, by the way. Ten seconds. One. All right, let's look at question number two. Simplicity, dignity, and restraint were all the hallmarks of classical Hellenistic art, and all three quali uh, qualities reflected the Greek vision of the world that was understandable and controllable. Based on these three examples, do you agree or disagree? Okay. I would personally write 
The restraint reflected in the vision. Understandable and controllable. Okay, so I would write, it's clear that the Greeks had a belief that the gods were in control by showing honor and respect to the gods, then life would be more predictable. All three pieces, specifically uh, piece one and piece two, show that the gods have a strong place of high respect. So, simplicity, dignity, and restraint were all hallmarks of classical art. All three qualities reflected in the Greek vision of the world. Okay? So, respond. Make sure you're citing two pieces. If you need to draw an arrow to write more above, that's fine. Make sure you're referencing two pieces, please. To be honest, the easiest one would be piece one and piece two. You could argue three, but it's easier in piece one and piece two. Twenty seconds. Ten seconds. transitioning join me please this will be due tomorrow if you have not finished your map which you should have if you were here you should have finished it because we had finished it without a problem this is due tomorrow so if you have not finished it finish then i am transitioning to persian people always have an issue with persian so let's get to it here we go so your persian empires there's officially four i cannot stress on my back wall i have a little cheat sheet my wall has been updated. I would totally take a picture of it. I label everything period one, period two. If you look under period two, I have my Persians, the Ottoman, the Suclids, the Parthenians, and the Assassinids. Now, please keep in mind, I always have little big, uh, little hints up there about what they're accomplishing. So, I would take a picture of it. I My notes are really helpful, believe me. This wall is really for me, not for you. But it's a great resource. Keep that in mind. All right, here we go. So your Persian empires, they're going to start with the Achaemenids, then the Seuclids, the Parthenians, and the Sassanids. Now the Achaemenid Empire, okay? The Achaemenid Empire is going to be the most influential of all the Persians. So I'm kind of just going to go a little bit. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So your first major one. Here we go. Major one. Alright, so what you're going to see is that we're going to have people moving. Now, the Persians are really going to start coming in as the Assyrians are falling down. Assyrians are there at the beginning or the end of the Mesopotamian Empire. And so as the Assyrians are falling, the Persians are rising. Every empire rises, every empire falls. When one empire falls, someone else is rising. 
China does it the best with the mandate of heaven and explaining everything, but everyone rises, everyone falls. Now, your big person that you need to know is that the Achmed's the first major person is going to be Cyrus, C-R-C-Y-R-U-S. He is the founder of the empire. However, the most important ruler is Darius. Yes, you do need to know the name, most important. Most important ruler, okay? And his capital, which will change, is P E R E P E R S E. Oh, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, yeah, it's kind of, it's, it's a little bit, okay? So, now your Ogman administration. Now, there's going to be 23 administration division, uh, divisions. You're going to have principal local staff. So, is it going to be centralized or decentralized? Decentralized government. There you go. So, they are decentralized, but the key to theirs is decentralized with spies, like straight up espionage. So it's decentralized, so you have local rulers in place. However, how the main central government keeps their hands on everything is they have little spies out there. And by little, I mean hundreds of thousands of spies who are literally just collecting information and then sending that information back, and then the government goes ahead and kills whoever they need to kill. So, is this a better uh, ruling system than our decentralized government, say, for the Zao? Absolutely, because the Zao, did the decentralization work for them? No, it's the reason why it fell. So, they see what's happening there. So, instead of just doing decentralized, they do decentralized with spies. Very unique. You need to know it. Okay, they are going to standardize currency. Okay, and road building. Standards currency and road building is their big thing. Okay, they are the first ones to start doing it. They are also going to have a mail system, which is pretty cool. Okay, technologies. Okay, they have the Kenyon, and we also have the Royal Road and Courier Service. Okay, the Kenyon system is a big deal. Okay, and what that is, is